Great. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nicola Marzari, actually today broadcasting from the Paul Scherer Institute. And uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure to welcome here today uh, uh, Professor John Perdue uh, from Temple University. Of course, uh, John uh, doesn't require uh, any introduction to all of us. Uh, uh, but it's actually also very nice and good uh, to, to go over a little bit uh, on uh, his career. Actually, he started uh, uh, with a PhD at uh, Cornell University, uh, working with uh, John Wilkins. Uh, told me yesterday, actually, on the uh, night shift in liquid metals uh, using uh, Ashko pseudo potentials. Neil Ashko was also uh, a new faculty member there at Cornell. And so in his words, he didn't know anything about density functional theory. And for that, I moved to the University of Toronto, uh, working uh, with Sai Vosco, and then uh, uh, at Rutgers University, uh, working with uh, David Langren, another of uh, you know, the key figures uh, in the early development of uh, electronic structure theory. Uh, he joined uh, Tulane University in 1977, and uh, he has been there uh, for a long time until in 2013, uh, he moved uh, to Temple University, uh, where he is the Laura Carnell Professor of uh, Physics and Chemistry and the founding director of the Center for uh, Materials Theory. Um, many honors, I'd just like to, to, to mention here, uh, you know, the induction into the International Academy uh, of Quantum Molecular Sciences, and also uh, to the uh, National Academy of Science, uh, in the US. Uh, he was also awarded uh, from uh, the Material Research Society the Materials Theory Award. Of course, uh, his work has had uh, an enormous impact uh, in the theory and practice uh, of electronic such a simulation. Uh, last I checked, uh, it had accumulated uh, 330,000 uh, cita citations. So this is, uh, this is quite a staggering uh, number that uh, uh, shows, uh, you know, what is the impact that the field has. Uh, so with this, uh, I'll uh, give the word uh, to, to John. Uh, I remind you that uh, you are very welcome uh, to ask uh, your questions in the question and answer pane. And uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, we'll ask uh, some questions uh, just uh, from that list, uh, or we also unmute some of you to go into the live discussion. And with this, uh, John, thanks again uh, for being uh, with us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Nicola, for the, uh, <clears throat> the invitation to uh, give this talk and, and uh, share with you some of the things that I and my collaborators have been thinking about in the past six years or so, uh, <clears throat> and also for the, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I noticed that, that you give a, a web address for for the recordings of all these all these uh, Marvel lectures, and I'm going to go and, and look look over those lectures and hear some more of them. I I did hear Alex Zungers, which was a, a an excellent lecture about symmetry breaking in solids. Uh, should I share the screen now again? Please, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, and... Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, so I want to talk about uh, more predictive density functionals, symmetry breaking, and strong correlation. Let me reduce these this a little bit so I can see what I see see the, see the slide myself better. Uh, so, uh, so the uh, uh, a lot of the talk that I'm going to give comes from uh, the kind of discussion group that I have had with Alex Unger and Mark Peterson about symmetry breaking in density functional theory. And, and the rest of the talk is about the scan functional and the self interaction correction, which uh, uh, are the, the the main things that we've been working on in in the past six years. Uh, and I'm going to. Uh, I've listed some of my other collaborators on this work here. Uh, I haven't listed all my collaborators, but these names will come up again when I mention uh, individual projects. So uh, I think there are two first principles of approaches for materials prediction. 
Uh, there's a correlated wave function theory and uh, extensions of that, uh, which give uh, uh, the right answer for the right reason, uh, but often at great cost and mainly for small systems, small, small mo atoms and mo small molecules. Uh, and there's density functional theory, which in contrast, uh, uh, promises to give almost the right answer for almost the right reason at almost the right price for almost all systems of interest. And uh, my talk will be about the uh, density functional theory. Uh, so uh, when I talk about materials, I include both molecules and condensed phases. Uh, by complex materials, I'm going to mean materials in which there are many different states or phases that compete closely in energy to be the ground state or more generally the equilibrium state. Uh, examples of these uh, 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 complex systems are water with its many possible hydrogen bond networks, um, materials with partly localized D or F electrons, such as many transition metal oxides, which are strongly correlated materials, and also uh, many uh, uh, catalytic materials that easily switch from one state to another. Now, from a fundamental point of view, uh, all materials are normally or strongly correlated. Uh, and they all obey the same first principles, uh, the Schrodinger equation and the Coulomb interaction. Of course, there are relativistic corrections and other corrections, but, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, we can understand a lot by just looking at the Schrodinger equation and, and the Coulomb interaction. Uh, and the density functional theory of Cohn and Sham is based on that picture. Uh, it, it offers us an in principle exact density functional for the exchange correlation energy, the many body uh, contribution to the energy that uh, serves as nature's glue. I call it nature's glue because it's uh, essentially what uh, binds one atom to a, form a molecule or a material. Uh, and uh, if we knew that exact functional, uh, and we only know it in principle, we could write down the mathematical uh, definition of it, but we can't evaluate it. Uh, if we knew that functional, that would deliver the exact ground state energy and the exact ground state density of any non-relativistic n-electron system uh, where the electrons uh, see a multiplicative external potential. And it would do that uh, by the self-consistent solution of n one electron Schrodinger equations, the Cohn-Sham equations, which provide a computationally efficient alternative to solving the n electron Schrodinger equation. Uh, and uh, from, the, uh, from the density functional, we can also predict the equilibrium positions of the nuclei. Uh, and uh, what we do not get from this ground state density functional theory would be time dependent states and excited states of the electrons. But those are accessible from a generalization of ground state theory that is called time dependent density functional theory. And I'll say something about that too later in the lecture. So uh, the exact cone sham theory would describe the ground states of all materials, whether they're simple or complex. And we have exact expressions for the density functional for the exchange correlation energy uh, coming from work by Mel Levy, Elliot Lieb, David Langreth. Uh, and uh, the, there, the evaluation of those exact expressions is impractical because typically they require wave functions which uh, are themselves computationally intractable and, uh, in many in many large systems. Uh, so in practice, this exact functional has to be approximated. Uh, but because exact expressions exi exist, uh, 
it's possible to derive the exact mathematical properties of and to incorporate them into the approximations. That's called constraint satisfaction. And I'll talk a lot about that in this talk. Uh, the, uh, the, the existence of an exact, exact uh, density functional in, in principle existence is also a great motivating factor. An existence theorem can motivate you to find better approximations because you know that what you're looking for does exist. Uh, now, the, uh, the, uh, the challenge of the complex materials is to make the approximations accurate enough and reliable enough to capture the small energy differences between competing states or phases. Um, another approach in, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, widely used in, in condensed matter physics uh, is the approach based on model Hamiltonians with fitted parameters. Uh, they're very popular for complex systems. They're revealing and useful, but I would say they're not general enough or material specific enough for materials discovery. If we want to actually predict new materials with, uh, 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 with, with the properties that we would like to have, then we need a, we need a, a first principles theory that's predictive. And the closest thing that we have to that uh, right now, I would say, uh, in a useful way, is density. Now, uh, there are two different but not mutually exclusive ways to construct density functional approximations. Uh, they're both widely used. The first one is to fit to a data set of real bonded systems, such as molecules. Uh, typically also satisfying a few exact constraints and appropriate norms. Uh, this is an approach I would, that, that's uh, still very popular in chemistry, and uh, it, it's, I would call it an interpolative approach because it often gives the most accurate systems for uh, answers for systems that are similar to those that have been fitted. Uh, and uh, uh, for a long time, the, this fitting was done by human beings. It's still being done by human beings, but machine learning is a new and powerful way to do this kind of fitting. Uh, the second way is to satisfy many exact constraints, which are the known mathematical properties of the exact density function. Some of those are bounds, some are equalities, some are scaling relations, limits. Uh, about 20 uh, exact constraints are known. Uh, and in addition to the exact constraints, one, one might want to use appropriate norms, which, are, which I'll define to be non-bonded systems for which the approximation should be very accurate. Uh, the first appropriate norm is the uniform electron gas for which essentially all non-empirical functionals are exact. Now, this second uh, approach is a little more first principles, and, and I think I would say it's a more widely predictive approach, but we still don't know exactly how accurately it can predict over the immense space of possible bonded materials. <clears throat> the, possibilities are, uh, the possibilities for uh, different kinds of materials are, are immense. Uh, so, I'm going to list uh, some computationally efficient semi-local density functional approximations that are constructed by the constraint satisfaction approach. The very first one is the local spin density approximation uh, from the work of Cohn and Sham in 1965. Uh, the, uh, it uses the uh, uh, exchange correlation energy of the uniform electron gas as its basic input. So the uniform electron gas is taken to be an appropriate norm. And all, uh, all that the construction does is to, is to make a functional that's exact for that appropriate norm. Uh, the, uh, uh, what we know about the, uh, the exchange, the correlation energy of the uniform electron gas was not a lot in 1965. In 1980, separately and Alder did their quantum Monte Carlo calculation for the uniform gas and gave essentially exact answers which have been parametrized over subsequent years. Uh, later on, uh, we realized that uh, 
because the, because the local spin density approximation is exact for the uniform gas, it inherits some, some exact constraints from the uniform gas. In fact, it satisfies nine of the known exact constraints. Um, so in 1996, uh, Kieran Burke and Matthias Ernzerhoff and I developed the, the PBE generalized gradient approximation. Uh, that wasn't the first GGA, but I, I think it was the, the first one that was based largely on uh, the satisfaction of constraints on the energy functional itself, rather than the exchange correlation hole. Uh, that satisfies 11 exact constraints and the uniform So, uh, so I was talking about scan. Uh, scan satisfies 17 exact constraints that a, that a meta GGA can satisfy. Its appropriate norms include the uniform densities, but also selected atoms. However, no bonded systems are included because we want to predict bonding. Um, like PBE and LSDA, uh, SCAN is not fitted to any bonded multicenter system. So I'd like to give you a little outline of the construction of SCAN. Uh, if, you, if you look at the known exact constraints, there are some that apply to all electron densities and there are some that apply only in certain limits. And many of the exact constraints cluster around either the limit of slowly varying electron densities or the limit of uh, one and two electron densities. And for each of those limits, it's possible to construct simple functionals. Uh, and uh, in SCAN, we uh, interpolate between those two limits using a uh, uh, a function of position called alpha, which is constructed from the local spin densities at a point. We find the energy density at a point by using the local spin densities at that point, uh, the gradients of the local spin, spin densities, and also the positive orbital kinetic energy density. Uh, and uh, this quantity alpha, which is a combination of those three ingredients, can recognize the slowly varying densities, the one and two electron densities. And it can also uh, recognize uh, regions uh, where density tails overlap. So scan interpolates between the first two regions and extrapolates to the third region. Here's some of the successes and failures of scan. It's much better than previous semi-local functionals for water and water at interfaces ferroelectrics, which are broken symmetry solids, uh, formation energies and ground state crystal structures of strongly bound solids, critical pressures for the structural phase transitions of semiconductors, some strongly correlated materials, uh, including manganese dioxide and the cuprate high temperature superconductors, uh, which are described uh, uh, without uh, a plus U correction. Uh, and in particular, in the high temperature superconductors, uh, uh, the cuprates, we find a, a gap closing under doping. We find the spin moment, the right spin moment on the copper atom. We find the right stripes and stripe fluctuations. All these things come out right with scan. Uh, we also find a good description of geometric and magnetic properties of materials, including the two-dimensional materials. Um, in chemistry, SCAN has been tested on Stefan Grimma's large uh, GMTKN55 suite of 55 molecular data sets. And SCAN was the best meta GJ tested, but, but it was outperformed by some of the hybrid functionals. Uh, if you look at one of the subsets of this test set, it's so-called mindless benchmarking set, which uh, despite the name is actually a very clever idea because it looks at artificial molecules that are never used to fit uh, uh, standard density functions. And on that set, scan out performed all the other functionals, including the hybrid functions. So I think that shows that the exact constraints really are predictive. They don't just interpolate, but they, they, they predict uh, uh, 
the properties of systems you've never looked at before. Uh, and uh, hybrid functionals are usually fitted to multi-center bonded systems, often with, sometimes with a few parameters, sometimes with many. Uh, they're often computationally expensive. They're very good for molecules. They're not so good for bulk metals, in fact, to, in my, as far as I know. Uh, <clears throat> and SCAN is somewhat better than previous semi-local functionals for some other properties, for instance, the the band gaps of insulators and semiconductors uh, come out uh, somewhat larger and more and more realistic in a generalized cone sham implementation with, of SCAN, which is the standard implementation. Uh, if you look at the transition metal oxides, uh, SCAN still needs a plus U correction to get a realistic description for most of them but the plus you needed is smaller than what is needed for PBE. And then there are a few cases where SCAN is actually uh, less accurate than, than PBE. For instance, uh, for the, uh, some properties of, of uh, transition metals uh, in the metallic state, uh, such as iron or platinum, or formation energies, uh, magnetic moments and vacancy energies. SCAN is actually not as good as PBE. Uh, I think that's because SCAN is a little too non-local for metals. Uh, in, in metals, there's a, a lot of screening of the non-locality and the semi-local functional may be better. Um, SCAN, uh, SCAN in its original form also makes some extra demands on the mesh for integration over real space, which is a problem in some computer codes, not in VASP, but in TurboMole, for instance. Uh, and uh, it also poses some problems for pseudo-potential construction. And those problems have been solved now with an R2 scan uh, by uh, James Furness and collaborators. Uh, R2 scan is very similar to scan. Uh, it, it satisfies 16 of the 17 exact constraints. And uh, it works a little better on average than scan because it's smoother, the construction is smoother. Uh, now, uh, the cost increase from SCAN is over PBE is roughly a factor of three, depends somewhat on the system and the code. And without being fitted to any multi-bonded, multi-center bonded systems, SCAN describes diverse bonds like um, a covalent, metallic, hydrogen, and even in intermediate range van der Waals. Of course, we don't get the long range van der Waals. Uh, now I'm gonna, uh, I, I, can you see the full, uh, the full slide? Yeah, yeah. Looks Good. Like okay, it. because I, for me, part of it is obscured by something here, but I, anyway, I, uh, as long as you can see it. So. No, no, it's, it's good. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, full non-locality. There are some exact, some of the known exact constraints that cannot be uh, satisfied by a, a, a semi-local functional like SCAN. Uh, and uh, those exact con constraints include exactness for all one electron densities and uh, uh, correct description of non-integer particle number in, in open systems. Uh, these really require a fully non-local functional. And uh, I call this the old and new frontier because uh, Alex Unger and I made a start on this in 1980-81 with our, our self-interaction correction, uh, which makes any approximate functional, typically a semi-local functional, exact for the ground and excited states of any uh, non-overlapped one electron densities. Uh, it gives no correction to the exact functional, and it typically improves LSDA for atoms and molecules. Uh, it, led to, it actually led to the discovery of the piecewise linearity of the energy as a function of fractional electron number. Uh, because, because the SIC is itself approximately piecewise linearity or satisfies uh, Koopman's compliance. Not exactly, but approximately. 
Uh, and this is the way that self-interaction correction is done. Uh, he, we start with the approximate exchange correlation energy as a function of the up and down spin densities, EXC approx. And then we subtract off on, uh, uh, on an orbital by orbital basis, the Hartree energy of each occupied orbital density and the approximate uh, exchange correlation energy of each occupied orbital density. Uh, that, that makes the, uh, the exchange correlation energy exactly cancel the Hartree energy for any one electron density. Uh, the Hartree energy is uh, this usual electrostatic energy of self inner energy of the density. Uh, the orbital density is the square of some, uh, some uh, one electron wave function or orbital. And uh, the total density is the sum of all those uh, uh, orbital densities. The localized orbitals in this approach are a unitary transformation of the occupied cone sham orbitals, which are the size. And they're chosen to minimize the SIC total energy. And in 2014, uh, Mark Peterson and Adrian Ruzinski and I came up with a, a way to uh, uh, do a unitary transformation at, uh, at a lower cost, which, produce, which is guaranteed to produce localized orbitals for the self-interaction correction. And, and the orbitals must be localized to make the self-interaction correction size consistent. Um, and uh, we have applied this to a number of problems, including water clusters, with uh, uh, some improvement over the uh, semi-local functionals. Now, uh, we have, there's something that, that Mark and I call the paradox of self-interaction correction. The Purdue-Zunger SIC uh, improves uh, uh, approximate functionals in, in, in the situation where the self-interaction error is dominant. Those situations include stretch bonds, transition states, charge transfers, and so on. Uh, but for the equilibrium geometries and energy differences of simple molecules, uh, the Purdue-Zunger SIC uh, at best improves the local spin density approximation, and it often gives worse results for the PBE GGA and the scan meta GGA. In fact, the better a functional is for the equilibrium properties before self-interaction correction, the more those properties are worsened by PZSIC. And uh, the root of this problem, or at least a root, one of the roots, is that the Purdue-Zunger SIC loses the exactness for the uniform electron gains. Uh, if, if the uh, approximate functional is exact for the uniform electron gas, it's very likely that the PZSIC to it will not be exact for the uniform electron gas. Uh, and uh, we've been able to eliminate that problem uh, without losing the correct features of PZSIC with good results for the correction to LSDA, not for the correction of the other functionals, unfortunately, but for the correction of LSDA, we, uh, we can in fact uh, make a, uh, a functional that is still exact for the uniform gas and much better than LSDA and, and self-interaction free. So, uh, so can we make the SIC work with the scan functional? We have not been able to do that yet, but we're working on it. We'd like to be able to do it. Uh, I'd like to mention something else that's related to the self-interaction correction, and that is a density-corrected scan or, or a scan at Hartree Flock. Uh, scan evaluated on the Hartree Flock density. <clears throat> uh, it turns out that <clears throat> many but not all of the self-interaction errors of scan for molecules and molecular complexes, and I'm specifically focusing on those, can be corrected by evaluating scan on the strongly localizing hartree fock density. The hartree fock density is not, a, not such a great density except in one sense. And in one sense, it's, 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 it's ideal. It localizes, uh, uh, it, it tries very hard to localize an integer number of electrons on each uh, nucleus. And, in, and when the nuclei are separated, it does that perfectly. It, it does localize uh, integer charges on the nuclei. Uh, 
So, so if you evaluate the, the scan functional or other semi-local functionals, not on their self-consistent density, but on the heart tree fox density, you solve a lot of the self-interaction errors that are related to uh, incorrect charge transfers or incorrect sharing of electrons between nuclei. Um, for uh, when we apply uh, scan to the Hartree Fock density, we actually elevate scan uh, for liquid, liquid water and water clusters to the accuracy of coupled cluster theory. And this is a uh, work uh, uh, largely from Francesco Pisani's group, but I, I'm also co-author co on that one. You can read more about density correction in the work of Kieran Burke and uh, Unji Sim. Uh, so now I want to come to discuss symmetry breaking uh, and strong correlation in density functional theory. Uh, it, I, and I have two examples of that that I'll discuss. One is the charge density wave in the uniform gas, and the other is the, is the uh, carbon diatomic molecule C2. So quantum mechanics suggests that any isolated finite system has a symmetry unbroken ground state wave function. Because we know, uh, and what I mean by that is we know the theorem that, that, the, that we can choose the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian to be eigenstates of other, other uh, uh, self-adjoint operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, and the, that uh, symmetry unbroken wave function can be strongly correlated if the corresponding cone-sham system, the non-interacting system with the same density as the interacting system, uh, has a nearly degenerate ground states of the same symmetry, uh, then uh, in, in a sort of perturbation, by a sort of perturbation theory analysis, you can see that the correlation will be strong because the energy denominators in the perturbation expansion will, can be very small. Uh, so standard density functional approximations uh, can uh, capture normal correlation. They inherit that from their uh, uh, appropriate norms, uh, but they don't they really capture strong correlation uh, except at very low density if you, if you use a, a symmetry unbroken theory. Symmetry on broken calculation. Uh, but if you have a good density functional, it can often capture the ground state energy of a, a symmetry unbroken, strongly correlated state by yielding a, instead a symmetry broken, normally correlated state. So what I'm saying by that is that, if, is that if the symmetry wants to break and you allow it to break in a density functional calculation, then you get a symmetry broken state in which these, these uh, degeneracies are now are absent or are removed. And, and it's a system with just normal correlation. You can describe it uh, much better. Um, <clears throat> these symmetry, symmetry broken ground states are not true eigenstates in finite systems, or they may not be, at least sometimes they're not. Uh, instead, there's there are states that have small energy uncertainties uh, in an exact theory, and thus they have long lifetimes, which can increase with system size. Uh, this is the, the an energy time uncertainty principle. If the uh, uncertainty in the energy is small, uh, the time over which the system changes can be long, and the system can be close to an eigenstate or stationary state. Uh, and in 1972, uh, Phil Anderson argued that it, he, he had a, a famous essay uh, called uh, More is Different, uh, which, is, uh, which, which I recommend that you read. It's in 1972 science article. Uh, he argued that symmetries break when time dependent uh, density or, uh, or spin density fluctuations which are not accessible in ground state density functional theory, but are accessible in time dependent density functional theory. When these, when these uh, fluctuations drop to zero uh, or to low frequency, 
And uh, he argued that antiferromagnetism in a solid is a symmetry breaking that uh, can persist for years. Uh, so if the ground state of, of a solid is, is, is in reality a, a singlet uh, state with zero spin, zero net spin, uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, ground state wave function will be symmetry unbroken and will not have any spin density anywhere. But there may be a symmetry broken solution that puts spin up on, on some uh, transition metal atoms and spin down on, on the others. And that uh, symmetry breaking, uh, if you create it, could create it in a real system, would persist for, for a long time. Actually, he estimated for years. So it would certainly show up in any experiment. Um, so my first example is the static charge density wave in a low density gel. Uh, the quantum Monte Carlo calculations of Seprilli and Alder in 1980 predict a transition uh, at an RS between uh, 65 and 100. That's a low density, but uh, uh, it's lower than, than uh, the densities in real metals. Uh, this uh, charge density wave has a wave vector of about 2.28 times the Fermi wave vector. Uh, and uh, that's roughly the, uh, the first reciprocal lattice vector of a BCC crystal. So the charge density wave is the precursor of the Wigner crystal, the Wigner crystallization that occurs at extremely low densities. Uh, and we can study the transition to the charge density wave by using the dynamic density response function chi of the uniform phase. Uh, and, and uh, so here's where, for the first time in my talk, we we're going into time-dependent density functional theory, uh, which is a subject I only started to appreciate uh, in the past year or two. Uh, so uh, the, the density response uh, is a linear chi function. Chi is a linear response of the density to uh, a time-dependent and uh, position-dependent external potential. So delta V is the external potential. Um, I think of it as a wave with wave vector Q and frequency omega. And delta N of Q is the response of the uniform electron gas to that uh, perturbation, that, that weak perturbation. And chi is the proportionality constant. And we have a, a Dyson equation that relates the, the, the density response function of the interacting system to that of the non-interacting system, chi zero, to the Fourier transform of the Coulomb interaction, four pi over Q squared, and to the exchange correlation kernel, FXC of RS, Q, and omega, which, uh, which uh, has a, uh, uh, a definition uh, as the derivative with respect to the, uh, uh, with respect to the density of the, uh, uh, time-dependent exchange correlation potential. So, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, exchange correlation kernel FXC is needed to give, give a, an accurate response function. And it can be modeled because we also know a lot of exact constraints on the exchange correlation uh, kernel. Uh, you can read about a lot of them in Giovanni Vignali's book on the electron gas. Uh, and uh, in 2020, uh, Adrian Ruzinski, Naraj Nepal, Jose Patarki, and I uh, proposed a model kernel uh, with, which satisfies those constraints. So it's the same approach that we're using the same approach for the kernel that we used earlier for the, uh, for the exchange correlation energy. Uh, and we found that uh, if you look at the symmetry breaking from the point of view of ground state density functional theory, it, it's predicted because the static response function, the zero frequency response function diverges when the wave vector is 2.28 times KF and <clears throat> when the, the density parameter RS is 69. That's within the range uh, separately predicted. Um, but uh, if we want to understand 
that from the point of view of Anderson's interpretation of symmetry breaking, we can go to time-dependent DFT and look at a spectral function, S of Q and omega, which is minus one over pi time, times the density times the imaginary part of the uh, density response function. And what, what we find when we look at that uh, is that it's concentrated, and, and we can use our, use our FXC of Q and omega to calculate that. And we find that uh, it's uh, that when Q is 2K, 2.2 times KF and RS is 69, the spectral function is very strongly concentrated at zero frequency. In other words, the density fluctuations of wave vector Q drop to zero frequency at this, uh, uh, at this uh, wave vector. So Anderson was right. Uh, of course, it's not surprising that he's right, but, but, uh, but uh, I think we, we have demonstrated that for the charge density wave. Loosely speaking, we can think of this charge density wave as a, as a uh, soft plasmon. And here's another paper which discusses symmetry breaking and uh, the charge density wave. Uh, the authors include Aaron Kaplan. And it's in PNAS. Now, uh, here's the picture. So, so what I'm plotting here uh, on the horizontal axis is the wave vector Q divided by the Fermi wave vector of the uniform gas. And on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the average frequency of a density fluctuation of wave vector Q constructed from the spectral function and divided by its value at zero frequency. Uh, there are two curves. RS equals four is the density parameter for sodium. And what we see there is that uh, the curves only go upward as a function of Q. Uh, and um, uh, at, at omega equals zero, we have the plasma frequency. This is actually the, just the bulk plasma frequency. So the plasmon dispersion at RS equals four is upward. And eventually we run, we run into the particle hole continuum, but the average frequency is still increasing as we go up in, in wave vector. And we get to, when we go to lower densities, the plasmons start to disperse toward lower frequencies. And at RS equals 69, the solid curve is the, the plasmon frequency up to the, up to the place where the plasmon enters the particle hole continuum. And beyond that, we just use the spectral function uh, to, to uh, continue to compute this average frequency. And we see that it drops to zero at about 2.28, and then it comes back up again. That's our charge density wave. Okay, so my last topic is spin symmetry breaking in the uh, uh, carbon two, uh, in singlet carbon two molecule. So singlet carbon two uh, and its equilibrium bond length is, is a strongly correlated molecule. There aren't many strongly correlated SP mole bonded molecules, but C2 happens to be one of them uh, because it has a near degeneracy at the non-interacting level. And the ground state, the, the cone sham ground state uh, has a, a near degeneracy at the non-interacting level with another state of the same symmetry which is an avoided crossing that occurs near the equilibrium bond length. Uh, the carbon atom, however, and the, the triplet carbon, which is a very low-lying excited state, are normally correlated. And um, most SP bonded molecules only show strong correlation when we stretch the bond away from equilibrium. But C2 actually shows it at, e at the equilibrium bond length. Uh, and this molecule has been studied by an accurate correlated wave function method, the, the full, full configuration interaction quantum Monte Carlo, which uh, a, that's a multi-reference uh, calculation, which uh, confirms its uh, strong correlation. And here, here's the reference for that. Now, uh, we can do self-consistent uh, LSD, PBE, and scan calculations. If, if those calculations are not nudged to break the singlet symmetry, uh, we cannot identify the singlet C2 as a strongly correlated molecule from LSDA or PBE 
because those functionals are not accurate enough, but the unnudged scan meta-GGA can actually be used to, to show that this is a strongly correlated molecule. Uh, and to explain what I mean by that, I'm gonna show you a little table here with the mean absolute errors in electron volts for the atomization energies of six normally correlated small representative AE6 molecules. These are all SP bonded molecules. Uh, standard test set. Uh, Hartree Fock exchange is pretty bad. It, it, the average atomization energy is something like 10 EV, and Hartree Fock makes a, an error of something like 6 EV. That's not very good. And it shows that the correlation is real and, and important in these molecules. When we go to the local spin density approximation for exchange and correlation together, we cut that error in half. Uh, when we go to the PBE GGA, we cut it down by another factor of uh, five. And when we go to the scan meta GGA, uh, we cut it down by another factor of five to about one tenth of an electron volt, uh, mean absolute error in the atomization energy. Now, if you do a symmetry unbroken scan calculation for singlet C2, it gives a 1.5 electron volt underbinding. And that's huge in comparison to the scan mean absolute error of 0.1 EV. So, so the, the symmetry unbroken scan calculation by itself tells you with, with no ambiguity that C2 is a strongly correlated molecule. It's harder to see that with PBE because the error is more comparable. Uh, to the quantity you're looking for. Uh, here I'm going to show you atomization energies for singlet C2 uh, that calculated for several functionals without and with uh, spin symmetry breaking in the molecule. Uh, LSDA, uh, so, so the experimental uh, atomization energy of C2 is about 6.2 electron volts. Uh, if you do LSDA, it, uh, it overbinds, and with spin symmetry breaking, it overbinds even more, but the spin symmetry breaking effect is small. It's only about two tenths of an electron volt for LSDA. If you do the PBE GGA uh, without, uh, it underbinds, with it overbinds a bit, and the, uh, uh, the difference is about 0.5 electron volts. The difference between, between symmetry breaking and not spin symmetry breaking in the energy is about 0.5. When you do a scan without, you see a very significant underbinding, uh, but when you allow the uh, symmetry to break, you get a 6.0 6 uh, electron volt um, atomization energy, which is pretty close to the experiment. And you can also see that the sensitivity of these functionals to symmetry breaking is increasing strongly from LSDA to PBE to scan. What does the symmetry breaking look like? Well, it, it involves a, a net spin density in a, mole, a singlet molecule that should not have any net spin density. Uh, the net up and spin down, spin down densities in the lowest energy symmetry broken solution are not located on the ends of the molecular bond on the atoms, they're located on the sides of the bond. Uh, and this pattern, uh, so I think Brett Dunlap was the first to find symmetry breaking uh, uh, with spin densities on the ends of the bond. And uh, Mark Peterson in 1992, uh, used an early GGA to, to, to find this, this pattern of side-to-side -side spin symmetry breaking, which is, all, which is also seen in the, in the, for the other functionals. It's the lowest energy solution we could find for the other functionals. Um, again, I wanna stress, when you do symmetry breaking, you have to nudge the system into symmetry breaking because the symmetry unbroken state is often uh, metastable, and so you have to, nudge it into the right, right solution. A Alex also talked about that. So here's my summary. I'm sorry I ran a little late. Uh, density functionals for the exchange correlation energy of a many electron system become more accurate and more widely predictive when they're designed to satisfy more exact constraints and appropriate norms. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, 
doesn't mean that you shouldn't fit to real systems, but, uh, but it means that you should satisfy the appropriate norms uh, and, and the exact constraints. Uh, so scan, scan is a good but imperfect non-empirical semi-local functional. It's computationally efficient. It seems to be very accurate for molecules and for semiconductors and insulators, a little less uh, accurate for, for uh, metals, but <clears throat> not as bad as the hybrid functionals, typical hybrid functionals for metals. Um, much of the full non-locality of the exact functional can be restored by making a modified Purdue Zunger self-interaction correction, uh, at least to the local spin density approximation, but without losing the correct slowly varying limit, so restoring the correct slowly varying limit. Or uh, you can also get good results for many systems by evaluating scan on a Hartree-Fock density. A localizing Hartree-Fock density often gives a better result than, than, than the self-consistent scan density for the energy. And finally, uh, density functional theory with symmetry breaking is, is I think, and these are early results, but I think it's starting to correctly describe the ground states of strongly correlated and complex systems. There's still a lot, of, uh, a lot of distance to go before we can really do that uh, uh, widely, but I, I think it's possible. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, invite any questions that, that you would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for, your, uh, for your lecture. And uh, I guess thanks to the internet gods uh, for uh, protecting it uh, <laughs> till, the, till the very end. Uh, as mentioned, uh, um, people are welcome to raise their hands uh, or uh, uh, type uh, their uh, questions in the question and answer pane. And uh, I'll, I'll start reading uh, some questions from the Q&A session. Sure. And uh, there is one from Anderson Gianotti that uh, I think has many, many levels actually. It says, uh, is the band gap a ground state or an excited state property? Okay, uh, that's a good, a good question, Anderson. Uh, it's both. <laughs> so uh, so it's, uh, it, uh, the band gap is an excited state property in the sense that it's the excitation energy of, of an electron from the, uh, from the top of the valence band to, to the bottom of the conduction band. But it's also a ground state property because it's the difference between the ionization energy and the electron affinity of the system. And, and the, ionization, the ionization energy is the energy to remove one electron from the neutral solid. Uh, and the uh, electron affinity is the energy to remove one excess electron from the, from the otherwise neutral solid. And both of those are ground state properties because they're energy, ground state energy differences. So the, the band gap is a, uh, second, uh, is, is a second difference of ground state energies as well as an excited state. And, and because it's, because it's, uh, an ex, uh, because it's, um, a ground state property, it's something that, that can be, that, that is within reach of the, the density functionals, but because uh, the exact density functional has, a, 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 as defined in the cohen sham scheme, has a derivative discontinuity, the, fun, the, the functional derivative action and the band structure actually jump by, by a finite constant when we cross integer electron number, we normally can't capture that in a in a in a cone sham calculation. So the cone sham band gap, uh, the, the band gap of the exact cone sham theory, without taking account of this derivative discontinuity change, is in fact too small, and it's about it's probably close to where, where GGA and Scan put it. Um, with with generalized cone sham theory, where where we use the orbitals instead of the density. That is to say, in a meta GGA or in a hybrid functional, uh, you can actually capture a, a, a lot of the and correctly capture a lot of the gap because because uh, it, those functionals are not constructed in a cohen sham scheme, but in a less restrictive generalized cohen sham scheme. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. I'll keep asking uh, from uh, uh, the question and answer. 
Um, so there is, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah. Uh, Marco Grioni is asking, uh, how well do this uh, upgraded functional reproduce uh, this uh, electron removal and addition spectra in uh, typically strongly correlated materials? Uh, we have not really looked at that. Uh, so, so, the, so I think that might be an interesting thing to look at, uh, to look at uh, the electron removal energies and the electron addition energies in strongly correlated materials. We have not looked at that. Um, I have a feeling that to get that right, uh, you, we, need, uh, we need also the self-interaction correction. If we, want to use, if we want to use the orbital energies, uh, if we want to interpret the orbital energies as, uh, uh, as um, quasi-particle energies, then uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need to use, uh, we need a, a hybrid functional or a self-interaction correction. Uh, and in fact, some of the work that, uh, that, that you have done, Nicola, on the uh, Koopman's compliant functional seems to confirm that, that, that you get a good, uh, a good description of, uh, of the quasi-particle energies when you satisfy the, yeah. the yeah. condition. Don't, don't, don't dare to apply to strongly correlated materials, but yeah, we are happy with it. Uh, one more <laughs> question uh, from uh, the Q&A, and then I'll pass for a live question uh, from uh, uh, Jennifer Sanchez Naranjo. Um, so Nikita Skidopoulos is asking, uh, uh, are all exact constraints uh, created equally? That is, uh, are they equally important uh, to satisfy? And then he was saying, uh, if you use, uh, uh, I think, CC density, I suppose, couple cluster density on scan, uh, would we also get uh, couple cluster accuracy? So two different questions. Are all exact constraints created equal? Well, that's that's a good question. I uh, I never know exactly how to answer that question, but I think. I, th I think they can't be exactly equal. I think they're all important in, in different contexts. The one that's perhaps the least important, in, 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 as far as I can tell, is, is the, the fourth order gradient expansion for the exchange energy. So we can take the, we can evaluate the exchange energy of a slowly varying electron density to fourth order in the density gradients. And uh, so the, the leading term in the gradient expansion is the local density approximation. Then there's a second order gradient contribution. And then there's a fourth order gradient contribution. That fourth order gradient contribution is not terribly important in, in our experience because when we, to, to go from scan to the uh, revised R2 scan, uh, which is more computationally efficient, the better for pseudo-potential generation and so on, we remove that uh, fourth order uh, uh, term in the gradient expansion uh, and satisfied 16 instead of 17 exact constraints, but we made the functional smoother. And that actually made it a little more accurate. So R2 scan is actually a little more accurate than scan, even though it only satisfies 16 of the 17 exact constraints. Uh, that's about the only, only answer I can give to that question. I think it's a good question, but I don't know the answer. In, in more Thanks. Uh, and th there was a second uh, unrelated question from Nikitas. Uh, that is, if we use a uh, couple cluster densities, or you know, very very good density on scan, would we also get uh, couple cluster accuracy? I I believe so. Uh, I, I'm trying to see if that has been if that has been checked. I don't know if we've actually checked that. Um, but I'm pretty sure that that will happen because uh, I, I think the, the, uh, uh, the one thing that the Hartree-Fock density has going for it is that it's localizing. And the couple cluster density will also be localizing. Uh, it will have many other correct features that the Hartree-Fock density doesn't have. So I, my guess is we'll still get couple cluster accuracy. Uh, and, and, and for some systems, it may be better to use the, the couple cluster density than the Hartree-Fock density. The only problem with that, of course, is that it's, uh, if, you, if you can do couple cluster for the density, then you may as well do it for the energy too, right? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have a question from Thomas Durant. 
But I think it goes back uh, to the, you know, naval research papers that you cited before uh, about the importance or not of uh, having consistent pseudopotentials. So, so Thomas asked, uh, when using scan, how is it important to use the updated scan pseudopotentials rather than using uh, PBE pseudopotentials? That's, uh, that's also a good question. Um, we, often, uh, we often do scan uh, with uh, PAW pseudopotentials. So PAW pseudopotentials are built into, uh, into VASP and GPAW and other codes. And they seem to be very transferable. So if you construct them for PBE, they work well with scan too. Uh, for a long time, we have uh, the only scan pseudopotentials were developed for uh, plane wave codes like uh, quantum espresso. And uh, there, uh, because, they, because in many cases, they're ultra soft pseudopotentials, they're not so transferable from one functional to another. And uh, in that case, it's be, uh, I think it's important to use a, a scan pseudopotential with scan. So if you're doing a, using soft pseudopotentials, I would say use, use a scan pseudopotential with scan. If you're using hard pseudopotentials, it, it may be okay. It seems to be okay to use the, uh, to transfer the pseudopotential from PBE to scan. Thanks. Um, we have two questions that are somehow uh, related. Uh, one comes from Raymond Amador uh, that says, uh, would you be able to briefly comment on the ability of scan, uh, perhaps in conjunction with other approximation, uh, to capture Van der Waals effect? Uh, for example, there is current work on scan plus uh, RVB10. So, yes, um, yes, I, I'll, 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 I'll try. We, we're working on that too. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated story. So, so scan is actually able to capture some intermediate range van der Waals interaction. It can't capture the long range van der Waals interaction because that requires full non-locality that's not present in scan. But the scan functional can recognize when two, dens uh, uh, when two densities are overlapped and, uh, and it can give a, a description of the uh, 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 essentially of the van der Waals interaction in this intermediate range. Intermediate range means roughly nuclear separations up to three angstroms. Uh, it doesn't capture the long range part. And so to get the long range part, we, we need to add a, uh, uh, a, a van der Waals functional like RVV10 or uh, Grimma's D3 and D4. And uh, when we do that, uh, most, most things improve. Uh, the re results of molecules certainly improve. So in the GMTKN55 data set, scan with D4 correction for long range van der Waals gives uh, uh, significantly more accurate results than scan. Uh, but sometimes there's a compatibility problem. Um, it seems that that for uh, uh, for for the the, the case of water uh, applied on uh, water evaluated uh, where scan is evaluated on the Hartree Fock density, there is a van der Waals component to the interaction between two water molecules, and it seems that we get a better description by leaving out the long range van der Waals correction than by including it. I think that's because these effects are, are rather small and fine, and uh, and we don't always get them right. So, so you can use you can use scan with a, a long range van der Waals correction, and most of the time you'll be doing well. But sometimes, sometimes it, it can make things worse. Thanks. And somehow related again, a lot of questions on scan uh, uh, from Marius Kadek. He says, uh, "What about the extension to the relativistic, uh, say, case uh, including spin orbit uh, corrections?" Uh, couplings. Uh, how much, uh, uh, you know, relativistic effects uh, affect uh, the applicability of the exact uh, constraints? Well, that's that's a, that's a that's also a good question, and I think it's an important question for the heavier elements. Uh, 
and even, even to some extent for some of the lighter ones. Uh, we haven't done much on that, and so I don't have much to say about it. Uh, it's, it's often, uh, people often argue that if you, if you take account of the relativistic effects in the kinetic energy, uh, in the non-interacting kinetic energy and in the uh, spin-orbit interaction, that the, 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 the relativistic effects in the exchange correlation energy are smaller and less important. Um, and I think that's true, but they, that doesn't mean that they're always unimportant. And so, and so uh, there might be work remaining to be done to incorporate relativistic effects into the, into the scan exchange correlation energy. So, thanks. And, then, any, and any functionals exchange correlation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions from uh, uh, Okan Kuxal and uh, from, oh, sorry, it's still Okan again. So he asked uh, twice the same question. But, you know, what about uh, uh, density corrected uh, scan uh, and uh, this uh, self interaction error? Maybe could you? Uh, delve a little bit deeper in a sort of uh, what is the, the the status there. Yes. Uh, so so there's a, there's a a, a a 2021 paper by uh, uh, Centra and and Martin, and uh, it's uh, it's a test of uh, it's a test of density functionals. Uh, density corrected density functionals for uh, molecules using this large uh, GMTKN55 suite of 55 test sets. Uh, the, uh, so it's so so it's a study that's restricted to molecules, but it um, uh, the results are interesting. Uh, what you find is that. Overall, if you, you compile it over, this, this test set has an overall uh, error measure that, that compounds the errors of all the 55 test sets. And overall, uh, if you evaluate scan on the Hartree-Fock density, that's better than scan on its self-consistent density. Uh, it's particularly better and strongly better for uh, energy barriers to chemical reactions, which are very strongly uh, uh, infected by self-interaction error. And uh, it's also, when you do, when you, uh, so, so when, you, when you add the, uh, <laughs> sorry, when you do the Hartree-Fock density correction and the, and the dispersion or van der Waals correction to scan, you get a functional which is overall not only more accurate than scan and more accurate than other uh, GGAs and meta GGAs. It's even more accurate than, than nearly all the hybrid functionals that 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 uh, were tested. Uh, and 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 there are a few hybrid functionals that did slightly better, but they were the errors were certainly comparable to the errors of scan plus D four plus uh, the Hartree Fock correction. So. So I believe that uh, uh, in many problems, not, not in all problems, but in many problems, the most important self-interaction error of a, of a good semi-local functional like scan is an error of the density. It's a charge transfer error. I think that's even what's happening in water, although I don't have a, the, the final evidence for it yet, but we're trying to, trying to understand that. Uh, and I think that most of the time, uh, the self-interaction error is an error of the density that can be fixed by using the Hartree-Fock density. Uh, there are some cases where that's, that doesn't work. For instance, uh, in the stretched H2+, where you have two protons and one electron, you stretch out the bond length. Then, the, then you have a one electron density, which is separated into two fragments, each with half an electron. Uh, semi-local functionals get that very wrong, and uh, using the Hartree-Fock density doesn't help. You need a real self-interaction correction to get that kind of problem, to the energy functional to get that problem right. My favorite, uh, my favorite molecule. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Mine too. <laughs> uh, Babu um, asks a question that I'm sure is in the mind of many, that is, uh, 
it's about the predictions of band gaps that of course are very important for uh, for actual you know uh, pro materials properties and so he's asked uh, is a scan uh, predicting uh, better band gaps uh, uh, than uh, hybrid functionals uh, or only certain type of functionals uh, um, or uh, you know in general i think it would be interesting to actually know your opinion in sort of what one should do with functionals and band gaps yes okay so so uh, so we have a we have a paper on the on the band gaps in generalized cone sham theory, and it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2017, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of co-authors, including uh, Adrian Rzhinsky and Jan Wei Sun and Hardy Gross and Kieran Burke, uh, many other co-authors, uh, Matthias Scheffler. It, it, it's 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 like a, a group photo, uh, but but if you read that paper, you'll you, you'll get a better idea of, of my my current understanding of band gaps. I think that uh, you cannot get good band gaps within within the traditional cone sham approach unless you can somehow evaluate the derivative discontinuity and add it in to the gap that you get from the one electron spectrum. Uh, you can get good band gaps in generalized Kuhn sham theory. You can get them for the right reason. Uh, so that if the, uh, if you have a functional that is, if you have a generalized Kuhn sham functional, which doesn't have a derivative discontinuity, and this would include, uh, scan and, uh, uh also the hybrid functionals. If, if you have a, if you have a, uh, uh, a generalized cone sham functional, you implement it in a generalized cone sham way, which means that you don't have a, you don't force all the orbitals to say the, see the same potential. Then uh, that functional has no derivative discontinuity, uh, but if if it gives the right answer for that very reason, if it gives the right answer for ionization energies and electron affinities of solids, it will also give the right band gap. So there's really great hope, I think, for getting uh, accurate band gaps from orbital dependent functionals. Um, yeah, uh, that's uh, now now scan scan doesn't go far enough in its non locality to really do that. So scan uh, the the um, uh, scan band gaps are are more accurate than PBE band gaps for almost any material, but it's a small improvement and it doesn't get Get, it doesn't correct all of the error by any means. You can do. You can correct much more of the error by using uh, hybrid functionals. I know uh, Lior Kronik has a uh, range-separated hybrid functional designed for band gaps, which gets band gaps of a, a wide range of materials uh, within about uh, one or two tenths of an electron volt. But uh, that requires real full non-locality. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. I'll have a question later, but I see Ricardo De Gennaro um, asking, uh, you know, in terms of uh, um, what I think uh, Wei Tao Yang calls uh, the many body self interaction errors, you know. So he says, uh, do you think that the Perdue Zunger self interaction correction improves or worsens uh, the many body self interaction error? Uh, okay, I, I think it improves it. Uh, it cases, but it may not improve it enough in some cases. Uh, I can give you an example of that. Uh, for instance, we uh, if we look at the uh, if we look at water clusters, these are, these are clusters of water molecules that are hydrogen bonded. Uh, we can do a self interaction correction to scan for that problem. And we find uh, some improvement over uh, in binding energy over the over the, the scan the scan scan by itself for these water clusters overbinds. It overbinds, for instance, the water dimer, and it overbinds all the water water clusters slightly, but enough to be, to be it's a small but significant error. Uh, if you do the Purdue Unger self interaction correction, you get an improvement. Uh, but the improvement uh, over, over uh, uncorrected scan, but you get a better improvement by doing evaluating scan on the Hartree-Fock density. 
So what I think that means is that the the uh, uh, the scan uh, scan density for for uh, systems that are fragmented, like these water, water clusters, is better. The the self self interacting correction density is better than the semi local density, but it's not as good as the Hartree Fock density in its in its uh, charge sharing or elect electron uh, in, in localizing integer numbers of electrons on the nuclei. So, uh, so I think I think that the, the versions of S, SIC that we have been using uh, are, are imperfect realizations of uh, of uh, piecewise linearity, and the Koopmans compliant method that uh, uh, Nicola and collaborators have used it goes actually goes further toward giving a, a correct linear behavior of the energy as a function of fractional particle number. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. I think uh, there are uh, um, a couple of questions that are very brief. They say, is a scan already available in some of the commonly used codes? And, uh, sorry. <coughs> and I, probably I think you have been using VASP where it's implemented. Do you know of other implementations? Uh, well, I think it's also implemented in quantum espresso, but you you could answer that better than I, right? <laughs> um, I, I I think so, although probably because I'm a pseudo potential fundamentalist, that is, until we have the say R two scan pseudo potential, I didn't feel comfortable in trying it out. But I I I don't have an answer right away. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I don't know for other codes. I'm sure there yes, is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's implemented in many codes. Uh, it's in the uh, turbomole, which is a molecular code. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's also available through the um, the libxc library of functionals. So if your code doesn't have scan, in many cases you can get it through libxc. Uh, one of one of the, the one of the standard codes that 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 doesn't have scan implemented in inside the code itself is is Gaussian. So Gaussian doesn't have yeah, it, but, yeah. but many codes do. And the QCAM is mentioned in the question and answer as a- uh, as, Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. scan, is, scan is in QCAM. Yeah. Let me ask uh, one last question from the uh, audience. And uh, Peter Kovacs uh, says, uh, you know, isn't the problem with including SICK in scan is that uh, the, the fitting of scan parameter was done uh, maybe without uh, the SICK included. Uh, so, you know, shouldn't you refit uh, scan uh, using SICK in the process uh, when you exactly add uh, these corrections? Well, uh, uh, that's, that's one possible approach. Uh, I would rather so so what we fit to are are, are the appropriate norms and, and typically the appropriate norms are the uniform electron gas and uh, atoms uh, and the approach that I would like to take is not not to to re not to refit scan for the self interaction correction but to redesign the self interaction correction so that it works better with scan that's that's what we're trying to do. I'm not sure that's the best way, but uh, but that's that's the approach we, we we're trying to take. It Thanks. is important if you if you for instance if you if if your self interaction correction loses the uniform gas limit as it often does, it's important to restore that. You could even re either restore it by taking it out of scan so that it comes back in the self interaction correction, or you could restore it by using the original scan and then adding another correction that puts it back. And that's, it's that second approach that we're trying to do. Thanks, John. And I think I have a last question myself, uh, and then I think uh, we should also let you, you know, catch your breath. But, uh, you know, um, we have often talk about spectral properties, uh, non-locality was mentioned. Uh, often, and there is a, a, a paper I'm very fond of by Matteo Gatti and co-workers, it's a PRL of, uh, from 2007, I think, in which they show that you can uh, actually write uh, a frequency dependent sham luther equation and, uh, you know, argue that uh, you can have uh, a spectral potential 
that reproduces uh, exactly the, the, the spectral function and the density of states. So in some way, the, the, the question is, uh, do you think uh, we should uh, you know, strive uh, for non-local functionals uh, to you know, sort of get uh, away from you know, this constraint of the derivative discontinuity? Uh, should we strive uh, for uh, uh, you know, dynamical functions that are local, but you know, energy dependent, uh, or you're actually optimistic that in a generalized Konecham formalism, we can just uh, get away with static local functional. That is, uh, where would you put your money right now? <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm, I'm putting my money now on functionals that don't have a frequency dependence. Except, except in the uh, in the work I described on the exchange correlation kernel and the charge yeah. density wave in Jellium, there there we actually built frequency dependence as well as wave vector dependence into the kernel, and uh, it was it, it's it, and that's important uh, for understanding how the how the how a uh, charge density fluct, uh, charge density fluctuation can drop to zero frequency. Uh, when the when the charge density wave appears, uh, it's I think it's going to be very hard to build frequency dependence into functionals for real materials, because it's, it it gives us another <laughs> you know it, 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 uh, uh, another parameter and another um, another problem to solve. I don't think we have a clear idea of how to do that except by going back and looking at what people do in GW theory. Well, I, I'm optimistic that you know the frequency dependent can become a orbital dependence in a sort of quasi-particle spirit. Uh, so you don't have to do it uh, just as a function of frequency, but at certain quasi-particle energies. Maybe. Yeah, I, so I know that's true for the band gap. Yeah. And, yeah. And do you think it's also true for bad widths and things like that? I, I hope we'll we'll discuss later. But okay. Sure. One more question. I, I'm sorry. There is one more question in the chat that I can't resist asking, and uh, it's really about the magnetism. Uh, that uh, that has many aspects. And uh, Shobit Singh asks, what limit the scan functional to correctly predict the magnetic moments in magnetic materials? And I think I would broaden the question in the sense that there is an issue of uh, getting the right uh, on-site magnetic moments, but then there is the question of getting, you know, all these, you know, multiple possibilities for magnetic state in a material. And I, I, again, I would be curious to know what. Yes. You know yes. <laughs> yeah. So there's the, there are all kinds of all kinds of symmetry breaking possibilities for magnetic materials and. Uh, as Alex Unger would say, you have to explore them all. You have to try to nudge the system in every every reasonable way to find the lowest energy symmetry broken solution. Uh, as for the accuracy of the magnetic moments, as far as I know, SCAN gives very accurate magnetic moments in, uh, in materials that are uh, insulating. Uh, and that includes, that includes materials <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> that are, uh, well, okay. Uh, it, it gives very accurate magnetic moments in, in insulating materials, including the cuprates. So we actually get the right spin moment on the copper atom and the right description of the spin stripes and so on without any, any uh, further correction, no self-interaction correction, no plus U. Uh, the, the, the cases where SCAN has a bit of a problem with magnetic accuracy of magnetic moments are in metallic system, systems that are in the metallic state, like iron, cobalt, and nickel, where the scan, the scan gives, a, gives a magnetic moment. These are itinerant ferromagnets mostly. Uh, and uh, it gives a magnetic moment, but the magnetic moment is somewhat too big, you know, like 20% too big compared to experiment, and where PBE actually gives a better moment. And there, I think the problem is that scan is a little too non-local for metals. The kinetic energy density that it uses is actually a non-local functional of the electron density. And uh, <clears throat> metals, I think, are very local. OK, I think uh, with, this, uh, with, with this last uh, comment, uh, um, I think uh, there were many 
uh, words uh, of thanks uh, in the question and answers, but uh, I think uh, all the audience and myself, uh, thank you for, uh, for, uh, for your time, John. Great, uh, great pleasure for us uh, to hear you. Uh, as you know, this will be recorded, so people will also be able to go, to go back. Uh, let me also mention, thanks, uh, Patrick, for sharing uh, the, the next uh, for coming uh, uh, distinguished lectures from Professor Ingrid Mer Mertig, Sharon Glotzer, Alan Asburuguzic, and Garnet Chana. So very exciting program uh, going ahead. And uh, thanks, John, again. Many, many thanks from all of us. And thank, thank you, Nicola, and thanks to everybody for your, your attention and interest. <laughs>